Dear learners, greetings from IIT Guwahati. We are in the MOOCs course, Power Plant System Engineering, Module Number Two, Vapor Power System Part Three. So this is the last lecture of this module, and uh, in which we will be concentrating on one of the important component of the steam power systems, that is cooling towers. So before you start discussions on cooling towers, we'll try to see basic background regarding various uh, aspects of the power systems. First thing is the requirement of circulating water systems. So here we'll try to see that uh, the main job of this cooling tower is to cater the needs of water requirement at various locations of the steam power systems so that is the reason we call this as a circulating water systems so it, there are different classifications to it we will try to discuss them like open through once through mode closed systems closed mode and uh, combination mode then we will try to see the uh, basic concept of the circulating water systems that is the uh, from the beginning when we start the concept of how to circulate the water at different components of the steam power systems then people started with various ideas such as cooling lakes cooling ponds dry cooling towers so these were the initial concepts for circulating water systems but over the period of time the modern power systems use wet cooling towers so wet cooling towers it takes the advantage of air plus water so main uh, aspects of this cooling tower is to take out heat from the, during the condensation process so in the wet cooling tower it, we use combination of air and water and take the advantage of temperatures for water as well as air with the psychrometric concepts and under this heading we will have a mechanical and a natural drop trap type so basic difference between these two is that in mechanical type we used different types of draft fans like force trap fan induced trap fan whereas you take the advantage of height of the cooling tower or design the cooling tower for a large height to take the advantage of density difference of air and that makes the circulation of air possible for a given local location and requirement and one of the most important aspects of this wet cooling tower is basically the mass and energy balance equations that needs to be solved but for that things we require the psychrometric terminology and we will try to see that how that psychrometric terminology will help us in doing the various calculations for a wet cooling tower this is the overall view of this uh, cooling tower sections now let us briefly talk about the need of the circulating systems the first and foremost concept if you recall our carnot cycle and basic rankine cycle which means is that for a given power output from the turbine we require heat addition in the boiler we also require some pump work and finally heat is rejected in the condenser now heat rejection is a must because based on the carnot cycle concepts when you say is a this is a heat engine which operates in a cycle and this heat engine cycle is nothing but this particular thermal circuit of the steam power systems and in which one of the way of heat rejection is the heat rejection in the condenser now where is this heat rejection that goes out it goes out to this cooling water so one of the important concept is that for certain mass of work output from the turbine we must reject heat to the surroundings and here the surrounding we mean either it can be air or the water which circulates in the condenser has to take out this heat so this is the basic need of the circulating water systems and mainly for condenser unit now let us uh, try to understand more basics of uh, the carnot cycle so if we just make some estimate considering this uh, heat rejections from the carnot cycle is qr 
heat addition rate is q dot a and uh, work output is w dot with a cycle efficiency eta. Then if you look at uh, for every case let us say we are trying to get 100 megawatt of power with various efficiencies of the cannot cycle. So, one thing you can notice here for given work output if you are by using this calculations with certain efficiency for a given work output if we can make a correlations how much heat we are rejecting to the surroundings or heat rejection rate then you can say for 100 megawatt we have to reject about 400 megawatts for small old industrial unit for fossil power units we must reject 300 megawatt uh, and for nuclear power plant it is a less but whatever may be the case we can see that heat rejection is a must that is for the requirement of the Carnot cycle. But how much heat rejection that depends on the nature of uh, power plant that we study. Another important aspect is that we can say there is an improvement of 7 percent efficiency that is from 0 0.25 to 0 0.33 which results 33 percent saving in heat rejection. And again our improvement of efficiency from 0 0.33 to 0 0.4 with that results 25 percent of heat rejections. So, in very bottom line is that we must reject heat and heat rejection quantity is about 4 times of the work output from the plant at the same time that means the requirement of cooling water is almost huge may be close to 4 times the amount of power which is going to be uh, delivered from the plant unit. So, it is this huge requirement is for this huge requirement we must have a proper circulating water systems. Now, this uh, circulating water systems normally is considered in variety of ways first thing is this is one through mode. So, what does we mean in the one through mode is that the circulating water systems is based on three concepts one is one through mode closed systems and combination systems. Let us try to understand what is this one through mode circulating water systems. So, if you see this figure we can see the condenser that takes in which exhaust from the plant comes from the turbine. So, this heat must be rejected to the cooling fluid. Now, here the cooling fluid can be uh, the circulating water and this circulating water can come from natural body of water surface of the water it may be a lake, it may be a pond, it may be a river. So, we can have a circulating pump that can enter and this condensate again can be discharged back to this same river or same water bodies, but at a higher temperature. So, initial temperature is T 1, but the final temperature is plus T 1 plus R with some addition of heat and again the condensate goes back. But here uh, what we see is the heated water goes out to the again the same water bodies. Many a times it poses ecological aspects of this water system uh, of the river. So, that is the reason this particular method is not generally employed. So, we move on to closed mode. So, the closed mode means that you use a separate unit called as cooling tower that does all kinds of water treatment before it discharges to the water bodies. So, that is the reason. So, the closed mode circulating water system means first you take the water and send it to the cooling tower, treat it, then send it to the condenser. Again from the condenser you take back the hot water, again treat it and finally, discharge it to the water bodies. So, that way entire treatment is normally done in this cooling tower only, so that the ecological systems of river is not affected. So, this is what uh, the what I have explained so far. So, uh, when you take the once through systems and discharge systems may be lake, river or ocean and this discharge can be a surface discharge, submerged discharge or diffuser type of discharge, but there are various advantage and disadvantage of various methods, but uh, most eff effective way is the diffuser discharge systems in which we can send this control water we can let the water out in a controlled manner through the nozzles operated in a long pipe 
so that ecological aspects of water bodies remains unaffected. Again this is a closed system mode, in the closed loop mode the essential requirement is this cooling tower which we will discuss more in details in the subsequent part. But here uh, the in apart from this cooling tower options though the beginning options that earlier options uh, for heat disposal systems could be a spray pond or spray canals. So, there are other substitutes of cooling devices. Now, in a combination systems what we do is we it operates in either it operates in both modes like once through mode or it can be operated through a closed mode. So, what it does is that so the combination uh, systems operates in a both modes like once through mode or it or a closed mode. So, what we have extra uh, devices here is there is a valve and that valve operates in such a way that if the water has to be discharged directly to the water bodies then this valve uh, becomes operational. So, we, uh, we run this system in a once through mode. If you want the water to be treated then the valve has to be operated that means entire water that comes out from the condenser goes directly to the cooling tower. After treatment it again gets discharged. So, basically speaking that uh, in both the cases if your initial temperature T1 which is takes from the water and when you do it in a once through mode the final temperature will be T1 plus R and but when you do this uh, combination mode the final temperature is be T1 plus TTD and this TTD we call this as a terminal temperature temperature difference and that is nothing but the temperature at the exit of the cooling tower and the source temperatures. Uh, so, TTD is a very vital term that is the difference between the exit temperature of the tower and the source temperature at which it is enters. And uh, there is another term which is called as a range, range is defined as the temperature rise across this condenser. So, we will discuss more details when you come back later when in our analysis of uh, wet cooling tower. Now, later let me give you some basic background that an earlier systems when there was no concept of wet cooling tower then people starts using the concept of cooling lakes is nothing but they are oldest and but simplest type of techniques for artificially rejection of heat from the steam power unit. So, what do we uh, normally do is that we can prepare an artificial made lead that means, you can pre prepare a area in which we put all the disposal of water into that uh, lake and in the lake uh, we allow maximum residence time for this water so that it becomes cool naturally. So, while uh, cooling naturally it can cool by evaporations or convection by wind or thermal radiation to the sky. So, through this means water gets cooled and uh, but what happens the but net effect of the cooling uh, is um, lake is not a constant because uh, over the lake area there could be variation of large water temperature differences and climatic conditions. So, ultimately uh, for this kind of modeling we come across expressions which normally gives equilibrium uh, temperature of a cooling lake which with a dependence from our heat transfer analysis we can do it and that talks about this particular expressions exponential expressions in this uh, that is T c minus T e divided by T h minus T e exponential to the power minus u a by m dot c. So, here T e is the equilibrium temperature T c and T h are the cold and hot water temperatures, C is the specific heat of water, mass flow rate of water is m dot, A stands for air surface area of the lake and we have one more term which is called overall heat transfer coefficients and of course, we have another non dimensional parameter that is u a by m dot c which is mostly most frequently used in the heat exchangers for heat transfer analysis in the heat exchangers. So, this is what we say we equilibrium temperature expressions for a cooling lake and from there once you have this uh, we can also find out what is the heat dissipation rate. 
The other concept is like a spray canals, which is also similar to a water cooling tower concepts. In this, what we have is the water is sprayed into air above the surface and the flow pattern is such that it goes in a channel through this process. Heat transfer takes place again by T2 evaporations, conduction of air, partial radiations. But another parameter uh, that gets drop popped into here is that weather conditions, weather since air comes into picture here, uh, air dry bulb temperature and wet bulb temperature is also needs to be considered. So, here we also use a similar governing equations and the notations are given in this things. But however, this is just an introduction of this, but now in all modern steam power systems normally do not use this old concepts of spray canals or artificial pond. So, we normally choose direct uh, method of using the circulating water systems through cooling towers. So, when you say cooling tower, there are two types, one is dry cooling tower, other is wet cooling towers. So, the first one is the dry cooling tower in which you looking at this figure, we have the schematic what it says is that the air and water they do not mix each other. Rather, what we think is that the circulating water is passed through the fin tubes in which cooling air is passed. So, circulating water is passed through the tube and in which the cooling air is passed. So, heat rejections from the cooling water is in the form of sensible heating to the air. So, that thereby we since we do not look into the concept of water vapor, so wet bulb temperature of air does not apply here. The term that is most important here is initial temperature difference. Uh, the next method is the wet cooling tower. In fact, wet cooling tower is a widely used methods and in this wet cooling tower, the heat rejection or heat dissipation process has following mechanisms. First is addition of sensible heat to the air that means air temperature increases when it takes the heat from the exhaust of the turbine. Then we take the advantage of uh, evaporation of portion of heat to the circulating water itself. Then addition of sensible heat of the natural water bodies. That means, we take the advantage of water bodies as well as increasing the temperatures. So, what we uh, look at a wet cooling tower concept is that if you look at the figure here, the hot water inlet comes which comes normally comes from the exhaust from the turbine they are sprayed. Now, when this they are sprayed, they are passed through a packing or fields. That means, it is just a kind of a arrangement where the entire slog of water gets splitted through series of nozzles and they are allowed to spray through the packing or fill. And from the bottom, air gets sucked through this packing. So, thereby when air gets in contact with this hot water, it absorbs heat that means, its temperature also increases, but again the air becomes. So, water vapor concentration in this air keeps on increasing until it gets saturated. Once it is saturated, it cannot absorb further mixture, but what happens when it goes up again when it comes in contact with water, its temperature goes up. So, thereby it keeps on uh, soaking the water vapors from the hot water. So, thereby through this process at the end of uh, this outlet, we get the air which is almost heated and saturated. That means, air does not have any more tendency to absorb any moisture from this water. So, through this uh, concept, this concept that means, we take the advantage of increasing the temperature of air. At the same time, the water vapor concentration in the air is also increased. So, thereby air has two temperatures right now, when well, at the starting point it has a dry bulb temperatures and it has certain wet bulb temperatures, but finally when it goes air is completely saturated that means both dry bulb and wet bulb temperature of the air becomes equal. So, through this process we take the advantage of air plus water vapor 
in which we take all the advantage of heat rejection process from this hot water unit. Now uh, considering whatever I have explained, we have to look into the upper limit of this air outlet and this upper limit of air outlet is nothing but the saturated air. Saturated air means air does not have any capability to absorb any more water vapors. So, evaporation of the cooling is stopped and when such a things with saturated water and that temperature we call this as a adiabatic saturation temperature or wet bulk temperature of the ambient air. So, this is the concept of the wet cooling tower system. Now, this wet cooling tower systems are classified by two ways one is a mechanical draught type draught draft or draught type both are of same word similar word other can be a natural draft or draught type and when they operate in either form they can be a counter flow type or a cross flow type. Now, let us understand what are these mechanical draught type cooling towers. So, here if you look at these figures mechanical means you are artificially allowing the air to enter into the tower. So, there are two possibilities of air entry the normally air enters from the bottom as shown in this figure. So, either it can be a forced draft type or induced draft type. So, in a forced draft type we introduce a fan which is at the entry of the air inlet. So, thereby we are forcing the air to enter into this tower and at the outlet the hot air goes on its own because it is already a hot air and its density is less. So, it goes naturally, but the main disadvantage in this process is that there is a tendency this fan introduces a back pressure that due to this back pressure the air distribution issues in the film arises there are possibility of leakages and recirculation of air back to the tower. That means, air again after recirculation again the, if there is sufficient pressure is not maintained air again try to reverse back from towards this main inlet. So, that is the main disadvantage of a force trap type cooling tower, but other options to remove these ambiguities is to consider this fan at the exit level. So, when there is a outlet at the outlet level you use a fan and that fan is nothing but induced draft type. So, it is basically you suck the air whatever it is coming you create a pressure difference in between you that means entire things pressure difference is felt in, in the entire tower. So, that by virtue of the pressure the air gets sucked in from the bottom and there is uh, hot air goes out at the outlet and through this process there is other advantage that happens is that mixing of water with air is very much possible in this field or packing that is an most important advantage for a induced draft type tower. Second thing issue of back pressure does not arise. So, with because of this advantage most of the wet cooling towers are normally induced draft type and if it of course, it if it is a mechanical draught cooling tower, but main uh, advantage is low capital cost construction cost small physical structures uh, of course, assured supply of quantity of air at all loads and all climatic conditions. The other way or other concept of wet cooling tower is uh, to consider a natural draft type. So, basically the issue of fan is induced either induced draft or forced draft is not does not apply here. So, what you uh, take the advantage the are to take the advantage of uh, this driving pressure as a density difference. So, in other words you said you use the concept of rising a height of the means you increase the height of the tower in a manner so that in a tall tower we can get the advantage of density difference of atmospheric air and within the and uh, the pressure inside this cooling tower. So, the so driving pressure becomes the density difference type g times to h. So, essentially the height h is nothing but height which is just above this fill. So, of course, this is the empty space, 
but this empty space is required to maintain this density difference. In that way, we take the advantage of the atmospheric air and in air inside this cooling tower to create this density difference. In fact, this natural draught type cooling tower has huge structures and the tower body above this water distribution systems which is somewhere here is an empty cell of circular cross sections but with hyperbolic vertical profile. So, in the vertical profile it is hyperbolic and that this structure is mostly preferred and they are made out of reinforced concrete and because it gives superior strength greater resistance to the unit loading at as compared to any other configurations. And moreover, if you want to see the difference between the mechanical draft and natural draft cooling tower, the essence of using a natural draft cooling tower is that they are suited for cool and humid climates for which we have low WBT that means low wet bulb temperature and high relative humidity when we have advantage of having low WBT and high condenser water inlet and outlet temperatures. When there is a heavy winter loads that means in a winter environment or in the cooling areas where we have this kind of climatic conditions then the choice of natural cooling tower is taken into account. But for other places mostly mechanical drop type and that that uses induced draft fan are mostly preferred. The another approach of design for wet cooling towers is to take into consideration of the parameters what we call as approach and range. For example, mechanical drought cooling towers use low approach and broad range of water flow whereas, natural drought types are preferred for long approach and broad range of water flow. Okay. Now, till this point of time we have seen all types of cooling towers, but most preferred cooling towers is a wet cooling towers and here we will try to understand how the heat is taken by the circulating water systems as well as with from the air. So, for that viewpoint we require the knowledge of psychrometrics and we will try to understand how the psychrometric analysis or terminologies help us in framing the governing equations. Essentially, the wet to cooling tower calculations involve mass and energy balance based on the steady flow and steady state equations. And there are three fluids which are involved here. One is cooling water, second is dry air and third is water vapors and water vapors which is associated with this dry air. In addition to this, there is also a term humidity which is plays very important role and uh, other assumption what we say that water vapors in the air is always at a very low pressures. So, we treat this them as a gas mixture. So, instead of water vapor we use it as a ideal gas mixtures in which we can use this ideal gas model for this analysis of water vapors. So, there is a term which is called a saturated air. Saturated air is a condition of air in which the air cannot accept any more water vapors at a given temperature. So, this can be obtained from the data tables in the steam table. That means, we all know that for a very saturation temperatures and there is a saturation pressure and vice versa. Any drop in temperature in the saturated air will lead to condensations. So, a newer cooling air would also be saturated. An increase in the temperature of the saturated air would make it unsaturated that means, it can accept more water vapors. That means, once it is condenses it cannot accept any more water vapor that means, I have to add new air into it. But if you want to increase the temp I mean any increase in the temperature of the saturated air will make it unsaturated. So, that way we can accept more water vapors. So, that is the controlling parameter that we can have in this wet cooling tower concepts. So, we take the advantage of this and keep analysis and do our analysis and all our conditions we will take the pressure uh, saturated condition as 15 degrees total pressure as 1.01325 bar 
based on which the psychrometric calculations are normally done. At that temperature, so you will from the steam table, you will find the partial pressure of water vapors. So, that way we can also find the partial pressure of dry air which is the difference between these two. The other term which is called as a relative humidity. So, relative humidity is equal to the ratio of partial pressure of water vapor in the air to the partial pressure of water vapor that would saturate the air at that same temperatures. So, this is a non-dimensional term. Then we have um, absolute humidity, humidity ratio or specific humidity they are all same term and it is the ratio of mass of the water vapor in the air to the mass of the dry air. So, the saturation pressure increases rapidly with temperature at all vapor pressures. So, the warm air can hold more moisture than the cool air that means, when your temperature increase it can hold more moisture. The other term is called as a degree of saturation. So, it is uh, the ratio of actual specific humidity to the saturated specific humidity. So, again it is a non-dimensional term. Now, for air we have three temperatures one is called as dry bulb temperatures, other is wet bulb temperature, third is deep dew point temperatures. So, if you recall this temperature entropy diagram property tables for water at any locations if you locate the state and whatever temperature you call that is a dry bulb temperature. Now, what you do you try to measure the temperature of air by putting this bulb of this thermometer keeping it wet. So, that way the temperature recorded by the thermometer would be less, less than this dry bulb temperature. So, essentially, so we are going along a particular constant pressure line and we are reaching one locations which will be at WBT temperatures. Now, by putting this dry bulb temperature, if you keep on cooling the air and we will reach at the saturation curve and that point the air is no longer able to accept any more moistures that means, air is going to condense. So, water vapor in the air is going to condense. So, we call this temperature as dew point temperature of air. So, psychrometric term has three temperature dry bulb temperature, wet bulb temperature and dew point temperatures. So, this is what we have explained here main important aspect in this cooling tower analysis is the wet bulb temperatures. If the air is relatively dry, water would evaporate from the gauge at the rapid rate resulting the cooling of the bulb. So, we record this as a wet bulb temperature. If the air is humid, evaporation rate will be slow. So, that means, wet bulb temperature approaches to dry bulb temperatures. We also call this wet bulb temperature as adiabatic saturation temperatures. Then dew point temperature means at the point at which the water vapor in the air begins to condense. So, it is this equilibrium or saturation temperature corresponding to that partial pressure. And for a saturated air all the temperatures that is dBT, WBT and dew point temperatures are all equal. So, whatever you have discussed so far a complete analysis of psychrometric terminology we can define by these expressions. So, here relative humidity ratio of partial pressure of water vapor to the saturated pressure, then specific humidity which is mass of the water vapor to the mass of dry air and considering this uh, ideal gas assumptions for water vapors, we can write down this gas equations that is for water vapors and for dry air separately. So, based on this we can get the expression for specific humidity in terms of pressure of water vapors to the pressure of dry air. Then we can obtain the expression of degree of saturation that is omega by omega max and this omega max is obtained by putting the P V is equal to P S. So, that is the maximum specific humidity that we can obtain. Now, with this psychrometric term we are now able to analyze the concept of psychrometric analysis. So, here there are three fluids one is cooling water dry air and water vapors in the dry air. So, you take a model which you call as a steady state steady flow model for a cooling tower in which hot there is a hot water entry and cold water out again cold air entry and hot air out. And when you say air it has two parts 
one is dry air part for which enthalpy is H A 1 and the enthalpy for water vapor is represented as H G 1 corresponding its omega 1. Similarly, for hot air out we have H A 2, omega 2 and H G 2. So, we take the advantage of the difference in the specific humidity of uh, air which absorbs more and more moisture as it passes within this tower. So, now if you see the complete equations for the energy balance for a cooling tower with this concept, then you can frame these energy balance equations. So, energy balance at the inlet we can have H A 1 plus omega 1 H B 1 and for water inlet we have W A into H W A. So, W stands for mass of the circulating water per unit mass of dry air and then again on the outlet side we have air outlet and water outlet. So, W B H do B H H W B and in of course, here H W stands for water because it is a hot water and cold water, but their temperatures are different. Then for air which is at 2 and at 2 it is almost saturated, air is almost saturated. Okay. So, considering this most of this data for given problem most of this data can be obtained from the steam tables and using this equations. The other approximations when you do this for air analysis, the enthalpy difference for because this air which is, which say which have a dry part, other part is water vapor. Now, difference between H A 1 and H A 2 is associated with this difference that is C P times T 2 minus T 1. So, once you know this inlet and exit condition of air, we can find the enthalpy difference for air. So, air and water vapors has to be treated differently. Now, putting these equations our final expression and of course, the mass balance equations it is nothing but dry air mass remains unchanged only the difference between the specific humidity will give you the difference between the whatever water vapor gets added into this air. So, this is about the final equations for energy balance and which talks about in this form and this is nothing but your working equation for solving the problem. So, you must remember this. Another part of this cooling tower design that we also require expect a pressure difference. So, the pressure difference normally is achieved from the outside air whose density is rho 0 and from the inside air whose density is rho i. And this rho 0 and rho i has two components one is dry air other is for vapor. So, it is treated in a differently total density calculation is treated in a differently firstly we take the calculation for water vapors first part consists of for air dry air part second part consists of water vapors that means this is for outside air similar way we can have the density difference for the inside air and this entire analysis will give you this density difference that occurs between the outside air and the inside air and this density difference with having this height will give you the driving pressure for a natural draught type cooling tower. So, this is the all about the entire analysis for white cooling towers. So, with this analysis let me frame this particular problem with some numerical data. So, whatever you analysis we have done so far we are now going to use this for this numerical problems with appropriate uh, data for a specific case which is a natural draught type cooling tower. So, the problem statement as this you recall our schematic model in which we have hot water in, cold water out, cold air in, hot air out. So, from this figure and data if I write down different conditions. So, let us see what is the hot air in. So, hot air in is whatever data is given which is W dot A 3600 
जीरो 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 गैलन्स पर मिनिट सो इफ यू सिंप्लीफाई टू के जी पर मिनिट वी से डब्ल्यू डॉट ए बिकम्स टू टू सेवेन वन फोर के जी पर मिनिट एंड वाट इज टेम्परेचर ऑफ वाटर विच इज एंटर्स थर्टी टू डिग्री सेंटीग्रेड ओके सो आट दिस टेम कंडीशन वी कैन फाइंड आउट वाट इज एच एफ ए फ्रॉम दिस टीम टेबल सो दिस नंबर इज वन थर्टी फोर पॉइंट वन फोर किलो जूल पर के जी देन हॉट वाटर आउट सो वी हैव डब्ल्यू बी विच इज नथिंग बट डब्ल्यू ए माइनस दि ओमेगा टू माइनस ओमेगा वन विच इज दि अमाउंट ऑफ वाटर वेपर विच गेट्स एब्जर्ड बाई द एयर दिस इज पर के जी ऑफ ड्राई एयर एंड टेम्परेचर एट द आउटलेट टी बी इज इक्वल टू ट्वेंटी वन डिग्री सेंटीग्रेड बिकॉज वी हैव रेंज इज इलेवन रेंज मीन्स दैट इज टी ए माइनस टी बी इज इक्वल टू इलेवन डिग्री सेंटीग्रेड सो टी ए थर्टी टू मीन्स टी बी विल बी ट्वेंटी वन डिग्री ओके सो दिस इज फॉर वाटर पार्ट नाउ लेट एस कंसिडर एयर पार्ट सो एयर कंडीशन इज टी वन टेम्परेचर ऑफ आउट साइड एयर इज फिफ्टीन डिग्री सेंटीग्रेड प्रेसर वन पॉइंट जीरो वन थ्री टू फाइव बार रिलेटिव इम्यूनिटी फाइव वन इज फिफ्टी परसेंट देन एट दिस टेम्परेचर वी कैन फाइंड आउट वॉट इज पी वी वन दिस इज जीरो पॉइंट जीरो जीरो एट फाइव टू फाइव बार देन एट सैचुरेटेड प्रेसर इज जीरो पॉइंट जीरो वन सेवेन जीरो फाइव बार Because we have phi, we can take phi as P V one by P S P V by P S one. So phi is given here. Okay, P S one we can get from T one using steam table. So uh, that is fifty percent. So this one will give you P V one. Then further information uh, we can calculate omega one. Like zero point six two two P V one divided by P minus P V one, and from this we can calculate omega one is equal to zero point zero zero five two seven seven kg by kg dry air. Once we know this, then at temperature T one. 15 degree centigrade steam table will implies hg1 that is uh, vapor you have to use the vapor condition 2258.9 kilo joule per kg so all the parameter is known and ha1 ha1 is cp times t1 in similar way hot air out so hot air out is saturated Exit condition of air is saturated. That is T two is equal to twenty seven degree centigrade. So we can say what is P S two zero point zero three five six seven bar. And then P S one is that omega two would be zero point zero two two six eight. Total pressure remains same. So we have omega two. Then we have Hg two corresponding to twenty seven degree centigrade using steam table. It is two five five zero point eight kilo joule per kg. Then H two is equal to Cp times T two. So we have at all locations we have all the data. Then we can use our working equation. We say that W one uh, omega one 
H G 1 plus W A H F A is equal to or here also H F B. H F B would be 88.14 kilo joule per kg is equal to C P times T 2 minus T 1 plus the omega 2 H G 2 plus W A minus omega 2 minus omega 1 multiplied by H F B. So, in these equations we have all the data that is 0 0.005277 into H G 1 is 2258.9. WA is unknown, HFA is 134.15 is equal to 1.005, T2 minus T1 is 27 minus 15 plus omega 2 is 0 0.02268, HF, HG2 is 255.0.8 plus W A minus omega 2 minus omega 1 that is 0 0.02268 minus 0 0.005277 entire multiplied by 88.14. So, this equation can be solved for W A is equal to 1.23 kg by kg dry air ok so what our question was what is the makeup water so moving further so from this we can find out what is the amount of dry air requirement which is m dot a is equal to w dot a by w a so, W dot A is already you have calculated gallons per uh, minute to kg per second 22712.4 divided by 1.23. So, this should be 18465 kg per second or M dot A becomes equal to 1.1 into 10 to the power 6 kg per second. So, first part of this and things we can write what is the makeup water m dot makeup would be m dot air into omega 2 minus omega 1. So, that is 1.1 into 10 to the power 6 into 0 0.002628 minus 0 0.005277. So, makeup water requirement becomes 1914.3 kg per minute. Then we have this second uh, part is the volume of the flow of water. So, volume flow rate of outside air. So, for that we need to find out density of outside air P minus P V 1 divided by R A T 1 plus P V 1 by R V T 1. Inside air P minus P V 2 by R A T 2 plus P V 2 divided by R V into T 2. So, R A we can find out 8314 divided by its molecular weight 28.96 287 joule per kg Kelvin R V is equal to 8314 divided by 18 this is 5.7.4 joule per kg kelvin. 
So, from this with all the data we can get rho i is O outside air density 1.22 kg per meter cube rho i is 1.203 kg per meter cube. Then volume flow rate outside air requirement would be m dot a into 1 plus omega that is equal to 1.0 omega 1 omega 1 data is already there 1.1 into 10 to the power 6 into 1 plus 0 0.005277 m dot out is 1.105 into 10 to the power 6 kg per minute. So, okay, this will be kg per minute. So, out then volume flow rate would be m dot air outside air divided by its density outside air density. So, this number will be 0 0.9 into 10 to the power 6 meter cube per minute. The second part analysis is done that is what is the volume flow rate of outside air and for third part we have this pressure difference that is delta P d is equal to rho 0 minus rho i into g times h. So, your height is this h delta p d is given 72.5 newton per meter square g is 9.81 meter per second square. So, for and density difference rho 0 and rho i are known. So, this will give you h is equal to 435 meter. So, for a natural draught cooling tower with this data we require a height of 435 meter for continuous operation of air to maintain this density difference. So, it is a huge structure normally done in the reinforced concrete. So, this is all about the numerical problem associated with this weight cooling tower. So, with this I conclude this lecture and uh, with this the module 2 is closed and thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.